Jonah chapter 3. <coughs> Get over there. So 3.10, the last verse in that chapter. And then right on through chapter 4. And the Word of God says, And God saw their works, talking about the Ninevites, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and did it not. Amen. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Boo hoo. <laughs> then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a booth, and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd, and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head, to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, and it smoked the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted and wished in himself to die. This guy just wants to die. <laughs> it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. Now, Heavenly Father, again, uh, I pray and ask for your help to preach this message, Lord, that you gave to me, to share with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray for those that are not here this morning, Lord. I haven't heard from some. I don't know why uh, they're not here. I pray that all is well with them. But, Lord, I pray that for those that are here and those, Lord, that will uh, later on uh, follow as some have been doing, Lord, uh, our messages uh, that we record and then post. Lord, that they will be blessed and encouraged and edified by this message. And we pray and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I was mentioned before we started about uh, evangelist Cordy Zorn. Uh, he's made this statement. And I, and I love because again, in, in his Louisiana accent, he says, Christians are crazy. <laughs> and I have to agree with him. Some Christians are just plain crazy. Uh, some of the things that come out of the mouths of born again believers, as well as some of the things that they do, I mean, they just plain leave me shaking my head. I don't get it. Now, Jonah here is a good example for us. Now he is a prophet of God from the city of Gathifer, which is located in Zebulun's territory near the Sea of Galilee. Now I just want to share just a little kind of a side note here for you. Real quickly, go over to John chapter 7. And, uh, why you need to know your Bible? John chapter 7, verses 50 to 53. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, here is with the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, 
Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. Well, you bunch of dumb simpletons. There's a prophet that arose out of Galilee. His name was Jonah. And he was the only prophet that Jesus Christ used as a sign to the nation of Israel concerning himself. As the prophet Jonah. Uh, by Matthew 12 over there. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 39 and 40. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Yeah, yeah these are supposed to be the guys that know the Bible. These, these, these are, you know, the, the uh, highly trained and educated fundamentalists. Jesus' time. You know, no prophet arises out of Galilee. Well, sure there was. <laughs> and see, the problem is, see, <clears throat> as so many of these types often do, they assume. They wrongly assume that Jesus was a Galilean. Right. Now, if they had done a little due diligence and asked and looked into his background, they'd have found out that he was born in Bethlehem. Okay. the home city of King David and that he had a claim to David's crown by his mother's genealogy by his adopted father's genealogy and by the commandment and promise of his true father God the Father in heaven See, that 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 you know, your good godly men and, and, and their, you know, you know, uh, great amount of, of training and, and learning. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little tidbit to throw out there for you about Jonas. Now, Jonah refused to obey God. He refused because he wants God to destroy the Ninevites. He gets swallowed by a great fish, whale, uh, prepared by God. I believe it was a whale shark. Okay. Uh, it's a great fish. Okay. They call it a whale. It's the size of a whale. And if you've ever seen one, it had no problem sucking you right down. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he is dead, dead, dead. Three days and three nights. He's dead. His body's in the belly of that whale. His soul is in hell. You go through and you read Jonah. His soul is in hell praying to God. Uh, you know, and you know, that's why Jonah is the type that Christ uses. Get myself back here where I want to be in Jonah. Yeah, and the thing is, he's not getting out of the job that God called him to do. Uh, the Lord has the future. They got the fish, take and puke Jonah up on the beach. <laughs> uh, and the Lord returns his soul into his nice, slimy, stinky body at this point, and he orders him on to Nineveh to fulfill his mission. <coughs> Excuse me. He must have been quite a sight when he entered into, into Nineveh. I'm sure they, they, were, they were thrilled to see him. Yeah. All these things stick together on me. Yeah. There it is. Thing is, he goes into Nineveh, and Nineveh responds. They repent. They humble themselves before God and the Lord, and God responds to that. And he forgives and he spares the city of Nineveh. And Jonah gets mad. <laughs> Jonah gets mad. Jonah 4.1 again. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Now what on earth is this kind of behavior? 
doing coming out of this man. Prophet of God. And why are there many believers today who are just as guilty of having the same kind of attitude? Well, let's see. Verse 2 there in chapter 4. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray to thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before the Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Makes me think of that church where they have Pennsylvania, I think it was the one that was protesting at uh, soldiers funerals and things and stuff you know this is the kind of attitude we're talking about here you know uh, you know when God called him to go to the city of Nineveh his initial reaction was one of anger I don't want to go and warn these people about their sin well why does he not want well they were enemies of Israel to begin with they were indeed a wicked and vile people. No question about it. They were worshipers of false gods. And, he, you know, I want you to punish them, God. I want you to punish them. I want you to destroy them. They deserve to be wiped out. He said, but I know you. I know you, God. <laughs> you know, I know if I go to Nineveh and they will hear me preaching and they repent and try to get right with you I know you're going to forgive them <laughs> wow he doesn't want them to be forgiven for I know that thou art a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil see Jonah knows and understands the nature of God he knows the character of God he knows that the Lord is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, as it says in 2 Peter 3, 9. Jonah wants no part of it. Why? Jonah is a spiritual bigot. Jonah is a spiritual bigot. He's like a Calvinist. You know? Well, he's an Israelite. I'm one of God's chosen people. I'm one of the elect. Right? Yeah. You know? And he's one who hasn't apostatized. Okay, what's going on right now, where he is, time frame here, this is when Jeroboam is king over the ten northern tribes of Israel. And he leads them into apostasy. He's afraid that they'll defect back to Judah because that's where Jerusalem is. That's where the temple is. That's where the Levites have gone to. That's where all the faithful have defected and gone to. And so he sets up two golden calves, one in Bethel and on up by, I can't remember what city it is, up in, in, in the, the tribe of Dan's area. He says, no, you go here to worship. It's easier. You don't have to go down to Jerusalem. Come worship at, you know, come and worship before your God. The golden calves are back, you know. <clears throat> that's that's the time frame that we well, you know, he's living up in Zebulun's territory. Just to the, the I believe it's the northwest there of the Sea of Galilee. He's up right dead in the middle uh, of Jeroboam's kingdom. He stayed faithful to God. You know, so not I'm an Israelite. I haven't apostatized, I have stayed faithful to God. And I'm a I'm a man of God. I'm a prophet of God. <clears throat> One whom the Lord speaks directly to, you know, and gives me things to give to the people, you know, and, and I'm jealous of my God. I don't want, you know, uh, <clears throat> he wants to see a supernatural flood come and destroy the enemies of God. He wants to see fire and brimstone come down out of heaven and burn them up like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, he, he'd love to see the earth open up. Uh, and, and swallow them up and, and send the entire city of Nineveh alive down straight into hell. Yeah. This is the kind of guy he is. Yeah. That's our man Jonah. You know? He's exactly the, the kind of follower of God that sometimes we get accused 
of being. After all, hellfire and damnation. You know, you've got no love or compassion at all, which is far from the truth. You know, but there are those out there that that's the mentality they have. And the ones who are like that, they refuse to be a witness and testimony to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh God, almighty, oh oh sovereign God of heaven, we beseech thee that thou destroy all your enemies who pollute the earth, the drunkard, the drug addict, uh, the criminal, the abortionist, the murderer, the rapist, the pedophile, the sodomite, the Catholic, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the apostate, the heretic, the devil worshiper, the atheist, the evolutionist, the humanist, the communist, the socialist, the liberal, and yes, the democrat. <laughs> You know, cleanse the earth of these your enemies, our opposers. You know, we pray to the O Lord God in the name of our gracious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and all the people said, Amen. You know, there are people like that. I'm telling you. I'm, I'm not just being humorous. Okay? They're out there. And it just keeps getting better, though. After Jonah gets done preaching his hellfire and damnation, you know, repent or God's going to destroy him within 40 days uh, there, well, you know, as he wanders through the city of Nineveh, smelling like a tuna on rye that's been out in the August sun for three days, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, and he starts making his complaint to God. Well, I went and did it. I did it. And I did it right. Okay, I didn't hold back, God. I did exactly what you told me. And sure enough, just like I predicted, they got right, and you forgave them. You forgave the rotten <laughs> Ninevites. Why would you do that, God? Why would you? They aren't Jews. They aren't your chosen people. They're not circumcised, pork abstaining, mosaic, mosaic law of uh, keeping and obeying people. They're Gentiles. They're dogs. They're scum. They're devil worshiping, child sacrificing, fornicating, drunken scum. Why would you forgive them? Praise God, He does. Mm -hmm. So are some of us. And you forgive him. Well, I guess it just doesn't matter if you love God and keep his commandments and try to do right, does it? Just kill me! Just kill me now! I can't take any more of this injustice. <laughs> yeah. And I have heard similar things come out of the mouths of those who are born again believers. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy. So Jonah goes and he sets up camp up on a hill the east side of the city to set up a watch to grumble and whine. And God asked Jonah a question. <clears throat> asked him a question. Doest thou well to be angry? Jonah doesn't answer him. I'm, 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 I'm too busy fuming here in my righteous indignation. <laughs> he sets up a little booth, there, a little shelter made from the brush to provide some shade from the sun while he monitors the city of Nineveh. And it goes on and says that God does some more preparing. First he prepared a great fish. Now he prepares a gourd for an object lesson for our uh, self-righteous Jonah here. Now this gourd plant supernaturally grows to a size where it's providing some really nice shade here for Jonah. I mean, it's not just the gourd, okay? If any of you have grown gourds or anything in that family, you know that they all get really big leaves. You know, and this thing had to have grown up something because generally they grow and trail on the ground. Uh, giving him some nice shade. 
to the extent that it says that Jonah was exceeding glad of the board. You know, you know, he, 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 he's, he's happy with this. You know, in fact, the Bible says that the Lord had done this to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah thinks that, that God's blessing him here. He's getting pretty comfortable out there in his little spot that he's got up there. He's got some great shade going. There's a nice breeze coming. Uh, you know, and he's out there and he's thinking, yep, yes, sir. Look at how God continues to just bless me. Maybe, hey, just maybe, God has come around to my way of thinking. You know, so I'm going to keep watching. Hey, who knows? That fire and brimstone might be coming at any moment. I don't want to miss the show. <laughs> Right? Well, the Lord did some more preparing. Next, he prepares a worm to attack the gourd, which withered and died. Then he prepared a vehement east wind, hot and dry like the desert, to just come along and suck the moisture right out of Jonah's body. Now, y'all know what a worm is, right? Okay. Okay, the souls of the damned become worms in the lake of fire. Where Christ says in the scripture, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus Christ became a worm when he became sin for all mankind. Psalm 22, 6 says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despise of the people. Now a worm is a serpent. John 3, 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, representing Christ, okay, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That brazen serpent that God had Moses made was representative of the fire of serpents that God had sent to plague the Israelites in the wilderness because of their rebellion. Hang on, there's more. <laughs> Can you think of another fiery serpent that we're warned about in the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. That old serpent, the devil, the red dragon. Hell, where Jonah got to visit for three days and three nights, was created for the devil and his angels. And they will all become flaming little red worms for all eternity in the lake of fire. I just want to throw that in there to remind him of this end. He didn't want, he didn't want to attack me. I just figured I'd give you a little reminder of what you got coming, fella. So the worm destroys the gourd that Jonah believed God had given to him to be a blessing. And I want to tell you, a lot of times that's exactly what happens to folks. When they want to behave like this, God will set him up and then let the devil have him. But here you go. <laughs> and now the gourd is withered and dead and Jonah feels like a piece of old shoe leather that's been laying out on a black asphalt road somewhere in northern Arizona. <laughs> you know, Jonah 4 8. Go back and we'll read that. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. This fellow is just one miserable old cuss of a saint, isn't he? <laughs> well, God repeats his question to Jonah, but adds in a little more. He says, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He didn't answer his first question. Jonah snaps back, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Oh, yeah, and you're a suffering saint, you know. Or tortured soul. <laughs> Jonah. I guess he's just he's miserable, he's bitter, he's unthankful. I 
man. Have you ever met a believer like that? I have. I've met them. Let's go back and read verses 10 and 11. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, when are more than six four thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? And I'll touch on that. People ask about that. Why God care about the cows? You know, he said, Why are you upset about the gourd, Jonah? You didn't plant it. You didn't nurture it. You didn't cause it to miraculously grow overnight. You didn't put it where it grew so that it benefited you. I did it. I did it all. And you're upset then when I also took it away in one night. Sounds just like another self-righteous complainer. A fellow by the name of Job. Now, at least Job knew better than to complain to God about it. Job 121 says, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still went on and complained to God, but he knew better than to, than to, than to blame God. Not, not Jonah. Not Jonah. I mean, can you imagine that, having that kind of an attitude towards God? <clears throat> then the Lord shames him in relation to his attitude about Nineveh. The Ninevites repented in sincerity. And just to be sure, they even have their animals suffer and put on sackcloth. And we go back and we read what the Ninevites do. Verse 6, back in chapter 3. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell? If God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger, we perish not. Well, praise God Almighty. Don't you wish everybody would respond that way when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. And so God does. He sees they're sincere. And he, there are 120,000 persons in this city who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand. Well, what does that mean? Back in Jonah 3.3, 3, it tells us that it, this is so large a city that it's going to take Jonah three days to walk from one end to the other. This is huge. This is huge. Now, the average healthy human being can walk 20 miles in a day. So if we take that as an average, that means that Nineveh from one end to the other is 60 miles. Now if that's a radius or excuse me, the, radius, the diameter you know this is the thing, this thing now supposedly New York City is close to 5,000 square miles of territory I don't think that that's necessarily so but you could certainly walk east to west from one end of New York City in three days, pretty easily. This place is huge, all right? Nineveh. So there's a whole lot more than 120,000 people living in Nineveh. 
Who are these 120,000 people that God is referring to who can't tell their right hand from their left? This gives you an idea of the heart and the mind of God. You know? They can't tell. They're not of the age or mentality of being able to be held accountable for sin. We're dealing primarily with children. God says, there's, there's a 120,000 innocents in that city. Aren't old enough to be able to be held accountable for right and wrong. Why shouldn't I spare this city just on their account? And God says, you know what? And just because of that and how they did it, I'm going to spare it because of the cattle too. Yeah. Years ago, when I first joined this church and we were still down near the boulder, one night after church, uh, and I we don't know, I can't remember if it was a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. It was dark out, so I know it had to be fall time probably or, or early spring. But I ran into a an old drunk military vet out there on the street. And I stopped to talk to him to give him the gospel. I don't know if the bar still used to be a bar there on the corner. I don't know if it's still there or not, but he, that's where he, he had come staggering out of there. Now, you know, I stopped to talk to him and give him the gospel. You know, and uh, he starts crying. He starts crying. He says, I can't go to heaven. He says, I can't be forgiven. I can't be forgiven. I said, why can't you be sure? Of course you can be forgiven. Let me tell you something. He couldn't forgive himself. I'll tell you why he couldn't forgive himself. He was a veteran of the Korean War. And he was involved in an incident where they were put guarding a bridge uh, coming across. I forget what river it was. And there was a lot of refugees coming across this bridge. And they had been given orders to kill anybody coming across that bridge because there would be communist infiltrators hiding in amongst this people. Well, it was full of old men, old women, women with children. Might have been a few young men or young women. Like I said, it was mostly old people and kids. Old people and kids. And they made me gun these people down. Now, there might have been some communist infiltrators in them, but not all of them. Uh, horrible thing. Couldn't forgive himself for what he had done. Didn't think God could forgive him for what he had done. Uh, you know, why, did I, why did I try to bring a stinky old drunken murderer Christ. Because God forgives. 